I rejoice with those who said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord for worship. Amen. Fellow believers in Christ Jesus, many of you no doubt remember or perhaps at least heard of Operation Desert Storm. That was in 1991 when the U.S. military, together with its allies, attacked Iraq with the goal of removing Saddam Hussein. You're familiar with Operation Desert Storm, but have you ever heard of Operation Moolah? This was also a genuine military operation. It unfolded in the 1950s during the Korean War when the U.S. government was offering $100,000, $1.2 million in today's money, to the first North Korean fighter pilot who would defect with his Soviet-built MiG-15 fighter jet. It's called Operation Moolah because $100,000 was a lot of moolah or money for these underpaid fighter pilots. Operational code names usually describe the goal or the way in which the goal will be carried out. Desert Storm, for example, was describing the way in which the U.S. military was intent on whipping up a storm as it raced across the Iraqi desert to Baghdad. If Jesus were to come up with an operational code to define his divine mission, it would be Operation Cross. One of Jesus' disciples, the Apostle Peter, objected to this, however, dying on the cross, that was loser talk. That wasn't fit for Jesus, the Son of God. Had it been up to the Apostle Peter, he would have defined the divine mission like this, Operation Couch. After all, Jesus is a king. Someday he will sit on a throne and have everyone acknowledge that he's king and serve him hand and foot. But it is the cross and not the couch that defines the divine mission, not just for the Christ Jesus, but also for us Christians. Failure to understand this, failure to live this, will have dire eternal consequences. Give your attention to the words of Jesus as they recorded in Matthew 16. In utter respect for these words of Jesus, please stand as I read them. We read from verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So far the words of our text, please be seated. Our text this Sunday is a continuation of the gospel lesson from last Sunday in which Jesus asked his disciples, who are people saying I am? After reporting the things that they had been hearing, Jesus then looked directly at his disciples and said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? It was Peter, often the spokesman for the disciples, who stepped up 
and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, Jesus must have beamed like a mother who for the first time hears her baby say, Mama. For Peter understood well Jesus' divine identity. You're not just an ordinary person. You are the Son of the living God. You are the Christ. Meaning the one that God has appointed to come into this world and to save us from our sins. For that rock-like confession, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a nickname. Up until that point, Peter's given name was Simon. And Jesus said, I'm not going to call you Simon anymore, but Cephas, which is Aramaic. We're more familiar with the Greek, Peter. If Jesus would have been speaking in English, he might have said, I'm going to call you Rocky. But Rocky crumbled after what Jesus said next. He said, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. That was too much for Peter. What do you mean, Jesus, that you must go to Jerusalem, that you must suffer at the hands of the religious leaders, that you must be crucified? Enough! Let's keep it cheerful. Let's keep it light. Let's keep it positive. This will never happen to you. Peter was treating Jesus as if he was some little kid that needed this talking to. Jesus did not hesitate to whirl on Peter and say, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. What? Cephas was now a Satan? Wasn't Jesus overacting just a little bit? Not at all, because Peter had unwittingly lobbed a temptation at Jesus that he had already undergone and fought off at the beginning of his ministry. When Satan himself had taken Jesus to the top of a mountain and showed him the kingdoms of this world, all its glories and riches and fame. And Satan said, all this can be yours, Jesus. Just bow down to me. Haven't you wondered how was that a temptation when everything was already Jesus as the Son of God? Because Satan knew what Jesus had come to do to save mankind from sin, he also knew that that divine mission had to go through the cross. And so he was offering an easier way. You want the crown? You want glory? Just bow down to me. No need to go through the cross. And that's also what the Apostle Peter now was suggesting to Jesus Forget the cross. Let's just go right to the crown. But Jesus pointed out to Peter, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. You don't know how salvation works, Peter. If I don't endure the cross, there will be no crown for you or for any other sinner. But this is something that we cannot understand or come to believe on our own. It's something the Holy Spirit has to bring us to believe. Yesterday I sat down with um, the Taubum family and we got ready for the baptism. And I asked this question, why should God let you into heaven? And we discussed some options. And one option, answer that many people come up with is because I try to be the best neighbor that I can be. I try to be helpful at work, kind to my family, and certainly God wants us to be those things. But as we were reminded yesterday, that's not enough to try. 
God says, you must do these things, love your neighbor as yourself, and, with, and love your God with all your heart, soul, and might. No exceptions, no vacation days, no excuses. But those who continue to say, I don't need Jesus to have to suffer and die at the cross. I'm a self-made man. I'll come before God on my own. But consider what you're saying. It's like if you got into an accident and your car is damaged and you say to your insurance company, don't bother. You don't need to pay for the damage. And it's not because you're going to get rid of the car. You want to fix the car. You want to repair it, get it back on the road. But if the insurance company isn't going to pay for it, who is? Even if you do the work yourself, you still have to get the right parts, and that costs money. You would be on the hook. By saying, Jesus, I don't need you or the cross, then what you're saying is, I want to be on the hook for my sins. And that is not a position that we ever want to be in because there is no way that we can ever finish paying for our acts of rebellion and self-righteousness. Aren't you glad that Jesus understood well the, defi the divine mission, that it was devi defined by the cross and not the couch? Because without Jesus' cross, there would be no crown for us. Jesus has more to say about this, however. He wants us to know that the cross and not the couch also defines our divine mission as Christians. Jesus put it like this. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? The cross of Jesus was made out of wood, and it was in the shape of the letter T. What does your cross look like? What's it made out of? And maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I get these migraines quite often. Or my family situation isn't the best. I've got these learning disabilities I have to put up with. I have a job that's not paying the bills. I just recently received a diagnosis that no one would want to receive. While those things are challenges that God allows into our life, they are not the cross that Jesus is speaking about here. Look carefully at these highlighted words. To take up our cross means to deny ourselves and to follow Jesus. Nicole and Melissa, denying yourself six months from now, Nine months from now might look like this, where Brooks comes to you with his favorite book, which you've read like 122 times, and he wants you to read it again, but you've just come off of work, it's been a rough day, you just want to veg, scroll through social media. But you deny yourself when you say, no, God has called me to be a parent, and here I have a wonderful opportunity to connect again with my son. Denying yourself might look like this. Your spouse wants to go for Chinese, but you've been gunning for Italian. I see a lot of looks here. Okay, I hit close to home. Denying yourself means, okay, honey, we'll go eat where you want to go. Denying yourself means that in the workplace or in the family, even though you have told others a hundred times what they should be doing, how they should be doing it, and they're slow to learn, slow to comply, you deny yourself and say, well, God has still given me an opportunity to show grace and patience, to live as a Christian, to build up, 
and to encourage. Denying yourself means that you stop your classmate when he's talking to you in the hallway about a friend of yours and he's disparaging that individual and saying how much better of an individual you are. Well, you would love for him to keep going because we love to hear how great we are, especially when we're compared to other people. But denying yourself means that you turn off the pride and you speak up for that individual who is not there to speak for themselves. And you put the best construction on their words and on their action. Are these things easy to do? Obviously not. That's why Jesus said the life of the Christian is the life of the cross and not the couch. We struggle to deny ourselves because from the moment we are conceived, we are turned in on ourselves. We only care about ourselves and what we want. Melissa, I guarantee that when Brooke starts to put sentences together, his first sentence to you will not be, Mom, your hair looks great today. But where's my bottle? And mine? And the battle of wills begins or continues. And it doesn't get easier, does it, parents? Right? Ever hear the terrible twos? What about the terrible 22s? and 52s, and 92s. This side of heaven, we never get to that point where we willingly put others first and live for them joyously and gladly. That's why we needed Jesus to go to his cross. Because the blood that he shed there wipes away those sins. And it also puts things in the proper perspective. Something else that Jesus warned about in our text is this. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Nicole, Melissa, I'm picking on you guys. I know that. But that's what happens when you bring someone here for baptism. Your goal in life as parents is not to just to provide the best clothing and house and education for your son. It's to teach him this truth. We're not here to build up for ourselves the lives that equal the lives of the rich and the famous. If that happens, great. But first and foremost, is it not to build up the soul that Brooks learns well who Jesus is? not just his savior, but also his daily provider. Because if he doesn't have that, Jesus says, you don't have anything. Jesus puts it really bluntly when he says, whoever loses his life for me will find it. Losing your life for the sake of Jesus, that really isn't as scary as it might sound. You lose yourself every time you board a commercial flight to go anywhere. When you enter the plane's door, you do not turn left and go to the cockpit and elbow the pilot out of his seat and sit behind the controls because by nature we are all control freaks. You don't even know how to back that thing out from the gate, much less get it into the air and back to the ground safely. If you insist on that kind of control, you put yourself and all the other passengers in danger. And so when you board a flight, you willingly lose yourself. You enter and you turn right and you go to your seat and you sit there and just relax for the next two hours. Because your faith, your trust is in that well-trained pilot to bring you to your destination. That's what it means to be a Christian. You're not running around trying to prove God that you're worthy of his love because you're not, nor am I. But he's already proven his love to you in Jesus. 
And so you board flight Jesus and you turn right and you sit in the chair and you relax and you say, Lord Jesus, you not only have my eternal future in hand, but every day, every doctor's appointment, every surgery, every morning I wake up without that loved one next to me. I'm going to lose myself in you. The life of the cross really isn't that bad. It's a blessing. And anyway, Jesus' life did not end at the cross, did it? He died, yes. But as he made clear to the disciples that not only must he go to Jerusalem to be killed, he must also go and on the third day be raised to life. It seems as if Peter totally missed this, went right over his head. What Jesus is making clear to the disciples and now to you and to me is this, that after the cross comes the crown. It did so for Jesus, and it will do so for you. But first things first, the cross now, not the couch. Daily pick up that cross as you deny your sinful nature, your desire to put yourself first, and rejoice in the opportunities Jesus gives to you to live for others and to serve them. Take up that cross in camaraderie with Jesus. His cross means that you have a crown that awaits. An eternal life where there will be no challenges, no heartaches, no more loneliness. Bear the cross daily, brothers and sisters. It's worth it. Amen.